Hello, lovely people. So I'm reading from the Corpus Hermeticum, The Way of Hermes, and this translation is by Salomon, Van Oyen and Wharton. We're on Book 14, Hermes to Asclepius. During your absence, my son Tat wanted to learn about the nature of all things and he would allow me no delay. As he is my son and rather young, and has only recently come to the understanding of these things, it was necessary for me to speak fully on each particular, so that the explanation would be easy for him to follow. Having selected the most important points we discussed, I wish to send you a summary of them, but I shall expound the more hidden meanings to you, because you are older and already understand the nature of things. All manifest things have been brought to birth and are still being created, and they are not created by themselves, but by another. Many things are in created, indeed all manifest things are, which are different from and unlike each other. Now if they are created by another, then there is a maker who must be unbegotten. Otherwise, he would not proceed all that has been created. So all that has been made was made by another, and only the one which is unbegotten can proceed all that has been created. Such a one is almighty, unique, and truly wise in all aspects, because nothing precedes him, for he is first in number and in magnitude preeminent in transcending his creation and in creating without cease. Moreover, all that has been made is visible, but he himself is invisible. Thus he creates so as not to be seen. He is always creating, and so he is always invisible. This one should understand, and having understood, one should wonder and having wondered, one should count oneself blessed, for having come to know the Father. For what could be sweeter than a true Father? Who is he, and how shall we come to know him? Is it right to give to him alone the name of God, or that of Creator, or of Father, or all three? He is God because of his power, Creator because of his activity, and Father because of the supreme good. And he is that power. He transcends all created things as he is that power in activity. He comes to be all things. Let us give up long and useless discourse. We must come to know these two, the created and the creator, for between them there is no third. In all you think and all you hear, be mindful of these two, and realise these two are all. Don't be perplexed about anything. What is above or below, what is divine or subject to change, or what lies deep within, for all these things are these two, the created and the creator. But it's impossible to separate one from the other, for there cannot be a creator without that which is created. Both are, in fact, the same thing. Therefore, one cannot be divided from the other any more than it can be divided from itself. For if the creator is nothing other than the creative principle, soul, unmixed, uncompounded, this principle must create by itself, as coming into being is the work of the creator, and all that has come into being cannot have come by itself. It follows that it is caused by another, and that without the creator, the Creator could not have been born or exist. For if either of these were without the other, it would lose its own nature, though being deprived of the other. If one accepts these two, the Creator and the Creator, then they are one in their union, one being first, the other following. The one who is first is God, the Creator, and the Created follows, whatsoever it may be. And do not be wary of the full variety of creation, for fear that you will abase God and extinguish his glory. For he has only one glory, which is to create everything. 
This is, as it were, the body of God, creation. Nothing evil or shameful can be ascribed to the Creator. These are afflictions which follow upon coming into being, like the green on copper and dirt on the body. For the coppersmith does not make the green, nor the parents the dirt on the body, nor does God create evil. But the continued existence of creation causes evil like a kind of ulcer, and therefore God brought about transformation to cleanse the impurity of birth. If one and the same painter can create heaven and gods, the earth and sea, men and all dumb creatures and inanimate things, could not God also create these things? To deny this shows great folly and ignorance of God. People who think this are in a most strange state. While they pretend to be holy and to worship God, in refusing to attribute to him the creation of everything, they are not only ignorant of God, but they insult his greatness by ascribing afflictions to him, contempt and impotence. For if he does not make all things, he does not make them either from contempt or impotence. To think this is sacrilege. For God has only one attribute, goodness, and he who is good is neither contemptuous nor impotent. For God is the supreme good, all power to make everything. All that has been brought into being has been brought to birth by God, that is to say, by the supreme good and by the power which can do everything. If you want to understand how he creates and how things are brought to birth, you can. Look, I'll give you a most beautiful and lifelike image. Behold, a farmer scatters his seed upon the earth, here wheat, there barley, and elsewhere other seeds. The same man plants a vine, an apple, and other trees. So God sows immortality in heaven, transformation on earth, life and movement in all. The things he sows are few and easy to count, four in all. And then there is God himself and also generation. In these all things exist. Hmm. I think we'll leave that book there. That was book 15 of the Corpus Hermeticum. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you at book 16.